So why don't you, because uh, you've spoken at a few cannabis conferences, can you just give a quick intro of uh, of who is this this guy, Raymond Cloyd, and yeah. where is he? Well, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Raymond Cloyd. I'm a professor uh, and extension specialist in horticultural entomology at Kansas State University, which is in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, I have a plethora of responsibilities, which include greenhouse, nursery, landscape, turf grass, Interscape conservatories, fruits and vegetables, pollinators, Christmas trees, grapes, uh, hemp, and cannabis. Uh, so, yeah, I have a, a very full plate. Uh, I've been at Kansas State University for almost 20 years. I was at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, uh, approximately six years before I came here. And my uh, appointment is basically uh, 70 Extension 30 Research. So we do a wide uh, diversity of uh, programming and uh, for both extension and research programs. Got it. And uh, so, so you 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 added hemp and cannabis in what year, like to the research uh, plate? The cannabis and hemp component, Peter, probably came about three years ago when. Uh, you know, people don't, people, uh, growers don't have a lot of information about the, the pest complex that attacks cannabis and also hemp. So there was a need for extension education, which included written information, uh, workshops, conferences that I, I attended to spoke at to give uh, growers or producers an idea of the multiple pest complexes they would be dealing with when they're growing cannabis uh, indoor and also hemp outdoor. Now we we can table the answer to this question if it's going to be covered in your presentation. But just generally, like as you started to research hemp and cannabis, kind of what was the most fascinating or interesting thing as you kind of got to know those plants? Well, really, the the most interesting aspect, and from a both extension research aspect, is that these are uh, monoculture crops that don't have a lot of or hardly have any insecticides and miticides register for use. So it's a really prime opportunity to uh, do biologic control, which I'll talk about in my presentation and learn a lot because it's basically a crop that I think is 100% biologic control, releasing predators or parasitoids. And we can utilize that as a means to better understand uh, more about biologic control in both the cannabis or a hemp production system. Awesome. Well, I think uh, let's get into it. So why don't you cue it up and then I'll, I'll put it live on the screen once. Uh... Okay. Uh, how do how do I get up there, Peter? Share? Or... Uh, no, 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 no. You've already shared it. So just uh, f uh, find your PowerPoint and just make it oh, large on your it. Uh, computer. There it is. Yep. Perfect. Okay. okay. So just want me to go ahead, Peter? Or? Yep. So we can see your entire presentation, YouTube webinar. Wow. Oh, you, even, you even customize it for us. Thank you. <laughs> I did. I go I, I go 120%. But I, I welcome everybody. Uh, the title of the presentation is Plant Protection of Han Cannabis Crops. I've already mentioned uh, I'm a professor and extension specialist in horticulture entomology, uh, plant protection at Kansas State University in the Department of Entomology. So... Uh, there I am. Uh, you can't see me, but uh, that is not a green screen. That is Venice. When I visited there uh, many years ago, a wonderful place to visit. And if I had a shot from the right, this is where you would see the Rinaldo Bridge, which is very famous. But Venice is a very spectacular place to visit, and I recommend it to everybody. So what you can expect during uh, my presentation uh, this morning or mid uh, or mid morning is I'll give you all a brief introduction. We'll talk about the insect and mite pests of cannabis, and then we'll focus in on what I call the plant protection strategies that include scouting, sanitation, mass trapping, and as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, biological control. And then if you have any questions or discussions, uh, write them down and we will address them at the very end of the presentation. So first of all, what is plant protection? Uh, it used to be called IPM or integrated pest management, but because of the confusion and the overuse of it, I've started using plant protection. And that means protecting your indoor and outdoor grown crops, horticultural crops from harmful organisms. And this is not restricted to just insects and mites, which is gonna be uh, my emphasis because I'm an entomologist, but also be for diseases, 
bacteria, fungi, viruses, and also unwanted plants such as weeds. So here's an example of an indoor production of cannabis, and they are using what we call biologic control. And the reason uh, I'll focus on biologic control is because you have a monoculture crop and there are hardly any insecticides and miticides registered for the crop because of its potential for consumability, whether it be for the CBD oil or wherever. And that restricts uh, the number, if any, use of, of insecticides and miticides. Consequently, it's a great opportunity for the use of biological control. So, well, you're growing inside a greenhouse and what are you going to encounter? Well, pretty much most of this, the typical insect and mite pests that you encounter if you're growing any horticultural crop, including Western flower thrips, broad mite, and two-spotted spider mite. And those are uh, just a sampling of the insect and mite pests that we will, we will be discussing. So what are the common insect and mite pests of indoor grown cannabis? Well, we have the foliar feeding aphids, we have thrips, two-spotted spider mite, the infamous hemp russet mite, broad mite, root aphids, and also root mealybugs, meaning these are feeding in on the roots uh, below ground, white flies and fungus gnats. Now, not every grower is going to get all of these, but in most cases through experiences so far, uh, these are the common insect and mite pests that one can encounter or a producer can encounter when growing cannabis indoors. And again, this would be the same listing uh, other than maybe the hemp russet mite that a producer would have if they're growing any horticultural crop. So let's talk about aphids. Aphids are sucking insects. This is an example of, I believe, cannabis aphid feeding on the leaf underside of a uh, cannabis, cannabis plant. So they are sucking insects. They do produce honeydew, which is a sticky, clear liquid, and that allows black city mold to grow on it. They have a high reproductive capacity. We'll talk about that. So you really have to have an aggressive plant protection program when you're dealing with aphids. So what is that program? Well, it includes diligent scouting, sanitation, removing unwanted plants in the greenhouse, and then we can use biologic control agents. And this includes a series of parasitoids. Now what's really important is you have to identify the aphid species so that will allow you in this table one to select the appropriate parasitoid. So if you're dealing with potato aphid, then you want to purchase the fittest aravi or aphelinus abdomalis. But if you're dealing with green peach aphid or melon or cotton aphid, then you select the parasitoids either aphidius colmani or aphidius matricarii. So when you encounter aphids and you want to use biologic control agents, in this case parasitoids, it's critical to get the aphid identified to species so then you can select the appropriate parasitoid to purchase from the biological control distributor or suppliers. And here's an example on the left is Aphidius aravi, the female laying her eggs inside of an aphid, and on the right is Aphidius colmani. Those aphid, the eggs will then, uh, the larvae will emerge from the eggs, they will feed on the internal contents of the aphid, and then cause it to be mummified or bloated. And from there, the larva will pupate, become an adult parasitoid, chew a hole out of the base of the back of the aphid and come out as an adult. And th those adults will mate and the females then will proceed to lay eggs into the aphids that are, that are present in that area. Those of you that have seen the movies Alien or Aliens, that's what a parasitoid is. What's really important to understand is all the biologic control agents I'll be talking about have an optimum temperature range in relative humidity. For example, Aphidius aravi, the life cycle takes about 14 days at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius and 20 days at 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. So the warmer the temperature, the faster the development of life cycle that will occur. Aphidius colmani, the optimum temperature for development and parasitism, that is the attack rate, is around 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees C. So again, each of these biological control agents I'll be mentioning has an optimal temperature range, relative humidity, and also day length for performance. When you fall in those, when you fall in those optimal temperature ranges, 
you're going to enhance performance of the net, these biologic control agents to regulate populations of the designated paths. So I do have an extension fact sheet out there. Those of you out there can download this online. Just do a Google search, and it has all the information uh, related to aphid management, including cultural, uh, physical, insecticides, and also, more importantly, biologic control. Okay, let's move on to the second pest, western flower thrips. Uh, the adult is on the left, larva on the right. Both of these are feed on uh, the, the nutritional content of the plant and cause and can cause plant damage. So the way we manage thrips is again intensive scouting, mass trapping, and I'll talk about that. That's putting this yellow sticky tape out and just capturing the adults on on this this yellow tape. It's very effective in reducing populations. But also you can use a series of biologic control agents, primarily predators. These include some predatory mites, uh, the insidious flower bug, and also the row beetle the Locia coriara. So these are some examples of the biologic control agents of Western flower thrips. On the bottom left is Aureus insidiosus, known as the insidious flower bug. Both the adults and the nymphs feed on the larva and adult stages of Western flower thrips. On the bottom right is Neocelus cucumris, and it primarily only feeds in the first instar larva of Western flower thrips. The Locia which is known as the row beetle, is in the soil or growing medium, and it feeds on the pupil stages of the western flower thrips. This is an adult, but also the larval stages will feed on western flower thrips pupa. So what's important to understand is what are the life stages these biological control, control agents prey upon? Well, the, the predatory mite, Neocelus cucumbers, feeds on, feeds on the first end star right there. Amblyosia swirskii feeds on both the first and second instar stages of the western flower thrips. Now, these are all above ground. The insidious flower bug feeds on the first, second instar, and the adult stages. Again, these are all feeding on the above ground life stages of the western flower thrips. Now, Stradulata scimitus, formerly known as Hypoapsis miles, is in the soil or, or growing medium, feeding on the pupil stage. And then Delosia, formerly called Athena coriara, the row beetle is also feeding on the pupil stages. So the first three biologic control agents are feeding on the above ground stages, larva and adults, and the mite and the delosia are feeding on the pupil stages, which are located in the growing medium or soil. So this is one of our studies. We've shown that the, uh, the row beetle is a very efficient predator of Western flower thrips. And what we have found is that Three row beetle adults per six inch pot is enough to provide regulation or suppression of Western flower thrips. So th I thought I'd pro provide some research science in there to substantiate uh, our recommendations. So the next pest is two spotted spider mites. And two spotted spider mites, like all insects, in this case is a mite, feeds on the leaf underside. This is a close up. And the reason it's called two spotted spider mite is because. It has these uh, distinct dark areas, which are where the digestion of the food source takes place. These are the eggs laid on the leaf underside. You'll typically see webbing, especially if infestations are severe. And here's the male and female uh, two-spotted spider mite. Two-spotted spider mites uh, are removing the chlorophyll content of the plant. And the damage we see from them is often referred to as speckling. That because the plant looks like each individual cell has had the chlorophyll content or the green pigment removed from it. So how do we deal with two-spotted spider mite? Again, scouting, and we'll talk more about that as we proceed through the presentation. But there are a lot of predatory mites out there, uh, commercially available from biological controlled distributors and suppliers. So what we have here, the workhorse, the one that's typically used in production system is Phytocelus persimilis. Now, this only feeds on the two-spotted spider mite, but it has an optimum temperature range of about 68 to 80 and an optimum relative, relative humidity about 50 to 60 to 70 percent. So when you get above 80 or the relative humidity is lower, the predatory mite does not function properly and does not regulate two-spotted spider mite populations. However, there are predatory mites such as Neocelus californicus and Neocelus fallacious that will tolerate 
either higher temperatures, lower relative humidities, or will feed in alternate food sources other than the two-spotted spider mite. Okay, the next one is probably the most destructive uh, and difficult pest to deal with, and that is the hemp russet mite. The hemp russet mite is what we call an areophyte mite. Areophyte mites are cigar-shaped looking. They only have four legs, uh, and the head is in one region. They're not the same as two-spotted spider mite. That would be a different uh, family. These are what we call areophyte mites. They're cigar-shaped looking, and they only have four legs, where your two-spotted spider mite has, like, like mice mites, has, about, has eight legs. So how do we deal with hemp russet mite? You want to start with non-infested plants. You want to again scout. Now, there are some biological control agents. However, let me say emphatically that you have to release these early on proactively before the plants exhibit symptoms. Once you have hemp russet mite, biological control agents are not an option. So if you want to read more, I wrote an article in the July 2020 issue of Cannabis Business Times called Win the Fight Against Hemp Russet Mites. And if you want more information regarding hemp russet mite, you can download that article. Okay, another mite out there. So we have the two-spotted spider mite. We have the hemp russet mite. And now we have the broad mite. And it's a very different mite. It's a tarsinemid. And the eggs of the broad mite have bumps or protrusions on them. And that is what we use for a diagnostic characteristic. And then over here is the, the adult stage, okay? We typically have your larva, nymphs, and adults. But the way we identify the problem is by looking at the eggs. If they have bumps, bumps or protrusions, we know they're the broad mite. The broad mite is also very difficult to deal with because once the symptoms are expressed in the plants, your only option at that point is to rogue or dispose of the plants. So there's close-up of the eggs. You can see the bumps or protrusions, and there is an adult broad mite. Broad mite adults have a distinct white band on, on their top. So how do you deal with broad mite? Well, very similar to hemp russet mite, you start with non-infested plants. If you're taking your own cuttings, check them. If you're bringing them in, be sure to check them as closely as possible. Scouting. And for biologic control, there are some predatory mites, but just like hemp russet mite, these have to be released early in production. You almost have to release them before you see the mites, which is really what you have to do, because once the broad mite damage is exhibited, then it's, it's too late to release any of these predatory mites. Now, root aphids and root mealybugs, I'm just going to cover root aphids, these are feeding in the roots in the growing medium, and they're not the same as the aphids I mentioned feeding on the leaves. These are very difficult to manage. You have to use clean or sterilized growing medium. Do not reuse growing medium. You have to scout by looking at taking plants out of the pot and looking for the aphids or mealybugs on the outside edge of the root system. You don't want to carry over stock plants, and although there's no data to back this up, the biologic control agent predator Delosia coriaria, which is a row beetle, would be an option. But again, we have no data to indicate that it would be effective against the root aphid. But uh, it, is, it is a possible option to try and see what happens. There are no insecticides registered label or that will be effective against root aphid or root mealybug feeding on the roots in the growing medium. So white flies are out there, and the nymphs are on the left. These are the nipple stages. There are about four nipple stages. The final one is also classified as a pupa, and the adults. Both the adults and the nymphs feed on plant, and the feeding is just like aphids. They're feeding in the phloem, which is the food-conducting tissues. Consequently, they'll emit honeydew, which is a sticky, clear liquid, and that serves as a growing medium or substrate for black city mold. Now, again, for whitefly management, we talk about scouting, sanitation, mass trapping, like I mentioned for Western flower thrips, but there are also some biologic control agents. We have some parasitoids, including Carciformosa, Everett Moster ceramicus, and predatory mites, including Amblyseus swirskii and Amblydromalis lemonicus. Okay, 
So I have an extension publication, and you're welcome to download it online. And it talks about everything I mentioned, just like aphids, biology, ecology, damage, management, cultural, physical, insecticidal, but more importantly, biological. Okay, so now we've covered uh, the major insect and mite pest of cannabis. Now let's talk about the last one, which is, again, feeding in the root media. And this is fungus gnats. On the left is the larva, and fungus ant larvae have a very distinct black head capsule. They are feeding on the roots. They are the damaging life stage. The adults flying around are more of a nuisance. They last about 10 days, and then they die out. Okay, So again, just like root mealybugs and root aphids, this is an insect where the damaging life stage is feeding on the roots in the soil or growing medium. So the way we manage fungus gnats is scouting again, sanitation, mass trapping the adults. And then we have some really good biological control agents, including the mite stradulus simitis, which is the same one we talked about for Western flower thrips. And again, the row beetle. The row beetle to me in our research is a, a very viable, good predator for fungus ant larvae. But also we have what we call entomopathogenic nematodes. And those are good nematodes that only attack insects. And the common one out there is called Stenonema feltii. So when I look at fungus ant management, it's basically releasing biologic control agents into the growing medium where they're going to attack the larval stage of the fungus gnats. Okay? So now let's focus in on some of these plant protection strategies that I have been mentioning during the course of the presentation discussing each individual insect or mite pest. So scouting, culture practices, sanitation, mass trapping, and plant spacing. And then, of course, round up with biological control agents. The culture practices, are I'm not going to get into it, include watering, fertility, um, things like that, giving the plants what they need. Sanitation, of course, is removing plant debris, growing medium debris, and unwanted plants. So the first item associated with plant protection is to establish a reliable and coordinated scouting program. That is getting out there, looking at the populations, determining the dynamics, and then recording, uh, being very diligent on documentation or recording information. So here's an example of a yellow sticky card we use for capturing adult white flies uh, and western flower thrips and also fungus gnats. You place it out there. So scouting is important to determine the presence or absence of pests and the population dynamics of insect and mite pests throughout the growing season. It, it, it isn't static. You do this throughout the growing season. So this is an example of Western flower thrips populations over two years, 94, 95. The y-axis is the average weekly thrips captured per month on yellow sticky cards. And the x-axis is January, December. And this is what we call a normal distribution. And we would expect this with insects because they're cold-blooded and they respond favorably when the weather or the temperature increases. So these population trends you see in greenhouses are going to be contingent on temperature and also the stage of crop development. So here's an example of RJ, uh, a, one of the scouting um, scouters I work with, and he's looking at a yellow sticky card with a hand lens, and he's identifying it, and then he's recording the information uh, in, his, uh, in, in his records. What is he recording? Well, what we have here is the week and month, the date, and then either thrips, white fly, mites, foxglove aphids, or aphids. So he's counting the number of insects on those yellow sticky cards, and then he'll, he'd probably replace it. So this is something he records. He goes back to his computer, and he enters it in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. And then he can graph it and determine if he's seeing any uh, fluctuations, any, any spikes in the population, which warrant some type of plant protection strategy to be implemented. Another method we can use, and this is very effective for thrips and spider mites, is we call the beet method. Take your plants, put them over a clipboard with a white sheet of paper, and you just gently shake it, and the spider mites and the thrips and the larval stages, the nymphal stages, the non-flying stages will land on there. 
Now, you're not counting. You're just sort of getting a presence absence estimate of the number of insects or mites that are on that plant and possibly in among the entire crop. So here's an example. This is not cannabis, but it's tomato. And we're doing the same thing. We're aggressively scouting by placing the uh, clipboard of the white piece of paper and then gently shaking the foliage. And that's giving us an assessment of what is out there. It's again, it's, you're not counting them. You're doing presence or absence. And we call this aggressive scouting. So most of the insects or mite pests are typically located on the leaf undersides. So you have to look on the leaf undersides for these. If you're on the leaf, looking on the leaf upper sides, that's really not going to tell you much. Okay. So how do you do this? Well, one tool that I recommend is a 10 or 16 power hand lens. I carry one wherever I go. And when you're, when you're out there scouting, you can look on the leaf undersides for the presence of eggs, larva, nymph, and adults of almost all the insect and mite pests we talk about, with the exception of root, aphid, mele uh, root, and yeah, root and aphids, uh, and fungus ant larvae that are feeding in the growing medium. Okay, but this works for aphids, white flies, two spotted spider mite, and western flower thrips. It's a little difficult to see hemp russet mite and broad mite with this. What you're going to need to see those are probably a dissecting microscope. And this is what we have in our laboratory. Just they're about $400. But when you see damage being exhibited, you can take it back immediately, look into the microscope, and see if you have hempressant mite or broad mites feeding. Or look for the eggs with the uh, bumps on them. Okay. I would say every grower, cannabis grower, should have one of these in uh, their office. Okay, so what's really important to understand is in the insect and mite world, it's a numbers game. Many of the females of the insects and mite we've talked about have very high reproductive capacity. For example, studies have shown that one green peach aphid after five generations can produce, get a load of this, 13 million individuals. That's a lot of aphids, okay? Spider mites also exhibit high reproductive capacity. So that's why you have to do aggressive scouting and aggressive plant protection because you cannot use insecticides and miticides like growers out there producing bedding plants or other crops. Uh, you just don't have those options. So you really have to be uh, cognizant and develop a sound scouting program and be out there regularly to minimize outbreaks of any of these pests. This is what can happen if you don't scout. This is a cannabis crop, and this is a da this is extensive damage caused by juice spotted spider mite. So if you're not scouting on a regular basis, which is at least once a week, maybe twice a week, uh, this is what's going to happen. Because these insects and mites, especially when temperatures are warmer, develop very fast and consequently can overwhelm a plant, and you'll end up with this type of situation. So what are your options here? Well... You could give it to a neighbor, but more than likely you're going to dispose of it as far away from the greenhouse as possible. Also, undesirable plants, weeds will host many of the insects and mite pests I talked about. This is a pigweed and this is leaf miner. Now, leaf miner is not a major pest of cannabis, but it gives an example of insects take, will use various weed species as a host. Here are aphids on a weed host very similar looking to cannabis. So again, you do not want weeds in any part of your greenhouse because they will conserve as a host for some of the insect and mite pests we've already discussed. Now, what about mass trapping? What mass trapping entails is getting what we call this yellow sticky tape. You run it along the benches get it close to the can the top of the canopy of the crop you can, and it'll capture adult thrips, white flies, and fungus ants. And you can see here all the insects that has been captured by the uh, tape. You can leave it up for the entire growing season and then take it down and start anew. Now, everything I've talked about is, cannot, is not used in isolation. 
These are all used together in a holistic plant protection program. So you, you use max trapping. You still need a scout. You still need to remove weeds and everything else I talk about. You don't rely on just one of these uh, strategies. But mass trapping, especially early on, will capture the adult and minimize the presence of the insect or mi not mites, obviously, but uh, certain insect pests. So now let's talk about biologic control, but let me step backward why. A cannabis crop is a monoculture, and you don't really have a lot to spray, and you don't want to spray because you don't want any residues contaminating your plant, especially when it's in bud and you're going to harvest that portion, especially for CBD oils, things like that. So cannabis provides a, a very good opportunity to use biologic control to the fullest and learn. So biologic control is the use of biologic control agents or BCAs, such as parasitoids and predators, that will regulate or manage insect or mite pest populations. Now, it's critical to understand that biologic control agents will not eradicate a pest population because they need a certain level of insects to maintain or sustain their populations. However, the success of a biological control program is contingent on maintaining insect or mite pest numbers at levels low enough to minimize plant damage. That's really what you're after, okay? And you really want to make sure you don't have insect or mite pest populations when the crop is in bud because you've got trichomes that are sticky and the biologic control agents will not function under those circumstances. So biologic control is a proactive. You release them early on in production and you don't wait till later on. So the key is regulation of insect or mite pest populations. There is a wide variety of biologic control agents commercially available from suppliers and distributors out there. I've worked with many of them. Uh, they have great technical support. The quality of the biologic control agents is sound. Um, and and we've, we know a lot about these, but again, we can learn more in a cannabis crop production system. So here's uh, one of the operations uh, I consulted on in, in Colorado. And we, we call it Aggressive Biologic Control Program, ABCP. And this is right here is when we're gonna start releasing our, our BCAs. So here's an operation I consulted with uh, in Kentucky. And these are sachets that contain predatory mites. You can see they're on the drip system. Well, what are those? Well, these are sachets that contain predatory mites, whether it be Neocelus californicus or whatever, and you place them right next to the plant. So the mites, which can't fly, will come out of the sachet get onto the plant and start looking for the uh, particular pest. Two key, two key guidelines. You want to put them close to the plant and you don't want to get them wet because they will rot. And this is a great operation because they were using drip irrigation and that minimized these sachets from getting wet. The sachets should last about two weeks. That is, that's when most of the mites will come out and last up probably up to six to eight weeks. Okay. Here's some examples of other biocontrol agents that cannabis growers I've worked with have used. This is the aphid parasitoid Aphidus aravi, which means that they had foxglove or potato aphid. They identified the species and they knew which parasitoid to release. Here's a container of roll beetles. Roll beetles are predators of the fungus ant larva and western flower thips pupil stage. And then the bottom right is the Beneficial nematode, Stenia nematodes. This is one of the products, and that is used against fungus gnat larvae in the soil of growing medium. So these are examples of products that cannabis producers have purchased and using in their operations. Okay, now this is, some of this is very labor intensive. Um, you know, for example, you know, releasing a container of this. This is a lot of labor. Well. What we've learned and developed is a technique that's a mechanized means of releasing predatory mites, and that is using blowers. So you put your container of predatory mites in here, and you meter it out. And studies have shown, we've done this, that you can distribute these over large areas of a greenhouse without harming the predatory mites. And the way we did that was, and you can do this on your own, is take petri dishes with water, place them out in the greenhouse, We'll do 
distribute your predatory mites using these, and the mites will land on the water, and you can see if they're alive or not. We've done this here at Kansas State. Uh, colleagues of mine have also done it, and we continue to do it to evaluate the quality assessment of the, of the natural enemies. So that saves you the labor of doing the typical salt and pepper shaker method of distributing uh, primarily the predatory mites. So uh, I want to I want to talk about two articles I wrote recently. One is titled Axe Aphids with Biologic Controls. And this article, which was appeared in the July issue of Cannabis Business Science, talks about the parasitoids, which I've already mentioned. And then the next month, August, or let's we'll say last month, uh, I had an article on the predatory mites you can release in cannabis, cannabis business time. So those two articles, you can download and read them and obtain more information than I can present uh, in this presentation. So key points to consider. Number one, aggressively scout your cannabis crops to detect insect and mite pest infestations early. If you already have an outbreak, forget about biocontrol. You cannot use it. And then you're limited. Either disposing of the plants or give them to your neighbor or competitor. That's another option. You want to correctly identify the insect nut mite pest because if you're going to use a parasitoid for aphids, you have to identify the aphid species. Determine the extent of potential damage that is assessed of spatial or space distribution or the time distribution, we call a temporal distribution of, of the problem. Assess plant growth stage, whether it be early or later on, and then you can select the appropriate plant protection strategies. Very important to keep detailed records of pest occurrence throughout the growing season to track population trends of the specific insect or mite pest. You can contact your state extension entomologist if you have one, if need be, for identification and any guidelines of what plant protection strategies you should implement. Okay, so these are key points to consider. So I do thank you for attention. I hope you all learned something. I really hope you learned something that you can take back to your operations and improve your improve your growing system. And with that, uh, that is the end of my presentation. I would like to thank Peter for inviting me and the bug doctor is in, and I'd be more than happy to address any questions or comments you may have regarding uh, this presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I uh, invited Saul on as well, who's uh, uh, if you minimize your uh, PowerPoint, you'll be able to see us again in uh, your uh, browser. Do I hit escape, Peter? Yeah, hit escape. And then you could even just quit or actually I wouldn't quit sure. it. I would just minimize. Um, I did. Yeah, I, I okay. can see Sal. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Peter, good morning. Good morning. So, so did uh, generally everything he mentioned. I mean, Saul's on on the front lines. Uh, you're doing the research. He's out there in the trenches. So, kind of, uh, did everything he talked about generally resonate with you? And kind of, what are you seeing? Uh, and and what what are the tools in your toolkit? That was uh, that was amazing, Peter. Thanks for bringing on uh, Raymond. Raymond, it's great to meet you. And um, geez, I um, I just I'm sitting here watching it and saying I this is so awesome. You know that we're we're able to get um, you know real biocontrol. You know people with knowledge of biocontrol on on uh, you know Peter's uh, podcast. Um, in particular, the um, what resonated the most to me is. Uh, my mantra is the the um, the foundation of all pest management, but specifically biological control, is monitoring. I can't preach that enough. Um, that slide that you had, which uh, discussed the key points to consider, that's so invaluable. I you know urge everyone to whoever watches this to go back and look at that slide. It's really critical. Um, I simplify the importance of monitoring, and basically what you really need to to look at when you're monitoring, I think this is my personal opinion, is what's out there, okay, what's the pest, um, where is it, how much of it is there, and what life stage it's in. If you have those, those four bits of information, you can make decisions that are not only going to be effective, but are also going to fit within your budget, and that's huge. Um, and, you know, 
the only way, well, the best way to make biological control work for you and, and fit in your budget is, as Raymond was saying, start early, don't stop. Doesn't mean you have to, um, you know, release high rates every week. Um, it means that you have to keep the balance tilted towards the natural enemy, right? Um, because biocontrol really has a difficult time curing a problem. So I always look at it as, okay, the most important thing is to be in a preventative stage to have, you know, biocontrol be as, as effective. Now, how do you know when you're in, pre in a preventative stage? By monitoring. There's no other way. And uh, that's why, to me, it's, it's the foundation. Raymond, would you agree with him agreeing with you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, as Sal said it. I mean, basically, uh, we reinforce biologic control is a uh, proactive. It's not really preventative. It's proactive. You're out there early. Uh, you're scouting. Uh, you're, you're taking notes about, like, like Sal said, uh, numbers or just presence, absence, and things like that. Uh, because once the populations are outbreak or uh, reaching damaging levels, it's really, it's really too late. Uh, and another thing I didn't I didn't cover, but I can mention is quality assessment. When you get your biologicals, you need to make sure they're alive. I mean, we know that dead insects won't regulate live insects, uh, but that could be another another topic. So at this point is, you know, you want to establish a good relationship with a biocontrol supplier, such as beneficial insectary. Uh, you want to order early. We generally say about two weeks in advance because the fluctuations can, you know, many of these uh, suppliers, uh, Sal, they get it from, from different sources. They don't normally, they don't normally rear their own. They get it from various rearing facilities. So uh, it's really important to order early, get them out there early, uh, and then, you know, continually monitor on a regular basis so you don't have these outbreaks occurring that result in the fact you can't use biologic control at that time. Yeah. And I think we just, uh, he, he must have accidentally disconnected or his Wi-Fi went out, but, um, so some of the stuff, I mean, we've talked, so a major focus of, of you, what you talked about in your presentation, what Saul focuses on is, is bringing in live predatory bugs to combat the bugs you don't want. But what about other, you know, m most people, it's like to have kind of like diatomaceous earth on hand or some sort of fungicide, uh, like, it's a little easier for your average grower to kind of have other types of things lying around. So can you talk about other, like, you know, for example, sp spraying with certain, like, like someone mentioned uh, kind of some of the Marone products, like uh, any thoughts on Regalia, Venerate? Um, Grandivo. But, Grandivo, yeah. but just generally, you know, things you could have lying around, like live bugs, you, That that's, a little more high level than most people are, are uh, able to do or prepared to do. So can you talk about kind of other things one could use? Yeah, that, that I, I, you know, again, Peter, it results in you. This is a crop where, you know, spraying to me is, is, is really not an option because of the, the way it's going to be processed overall. But I, I will mention, you know, we talk about sulfur. Sulfur has been mentioned it's both the fungicide and the caricide. Uh, however, it will kill all natural enemies. So you can't, you can't use it alone. You can't release predatory mites and apply sulfur. Uh, it's primarily miticide, two-spotted spider mite. Uh, hemp, hemp russet mite and broad mite are very questionable because of where they feed. Uh, other ones like uh, horticultural oils, like you know, mineral-based oils or petroleum-based oils, neem-based oils uh, are mentioned. These are suffocants, and they will... Uh, again, kill natural enemies, but they could be used against aphids and spider mites and drips, anything, anything feeding on the, uh, the foliage. Insecticidal soaps, potassium salts of fatty acids are desiccants, um, and they are also can be used. Uh, many of these just don't have, they, they don't have long residuals, and that's really the benefit of them, but they, they themselves will also directly kill uh, certain natural enemies. 
that okay. that was actually what I was going to get to because I think a lot of people ask that same question, which is, you know, I heard people talk about X, but will that also kill the green lacewing larva, the you know the ladybug larva, the uh, yeah, sorry, Chase is uh, trying to get on right now. Chase, you got to pick a camera source and an audio source, but let me see. Can, Can you I hear use us, Chase? Oh yeah, yeah, perfect. All right, perfect. There we go. So Chase, Chase is also, uh, you know, Saul's uh, working at scale in lots of greenhouses in Northern California. Chase also has a lot of experience at scale and sees the good, the bad, and the ugly. So Chase, why don't you throw in a question or two or comment? Yeah. So, um, anyways, it's a pleasure to to meet you, Raymond. I actually know your uh, OSU counterpart, Dr. Eric Reback. Um, that's actually the thing that I do whenever I move to a state is try is try to uh, contact uh, the local extension program and then also contact uh, the, the local university to be able to help develop uh, integrated pest man pet or pet or uh, plant man plant management like you were just. Um, uh, what I talked hey, to you Ch about. Chase, the, Chase, just quickly, are you wearing Bluetooth headphones? Yes. Do, do I need to pull that out? Yeah. Can you just kill them? And uh, I think because your audio is clipping. Your audio is clipping. That's, is that better? Uh, yep. Yep. Okay. Do I need to repeat what I said or did you guys hear me? Uh, I heard you. Okay. Um, but anyways, what I was wanting to ask, just what time, what time, here it is, here it is, here in the Midwest, most of the secondaries from the West from those. Uh, so I've had a lot of, uh, benefit, much benefit from DO, DOA. So I was, so I was, there was any, there was any recommend, recommend hey, here hey, in hey, the, shit, 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 shit. Hold, shit. hold on again. Hold on. Hold on. Do you, do you have the live do video have playing the live in the background the as back, well? Background. No. Okay, your your audio. Okay, it's like uh, audio you're audio talking, and then we hear you, hear you half a second later. Uh, um, let me kill everything else out. Up, oh, we lost him. But uh, well, while while we're waiting for him to come back, I mean, get, getting back to the kind of things that are, you know, it, it's like when you take a. Um, you know, a uh, penicillin or, or just something that wipes out all the microbes in your gut, the good and the bad. Um, so that's kind of some of the stuff people have been talking about. So a couple people on the chat mentioned uh, nicotine or, you know, uh, soaking, I guess, uh, tobacco leaves. Uh, actually, Chase was one of them. Tobacco is one of the best natural pest killers. And here's Chase. Can you hear us? Yeah, is that better? Keep going. Keep going. Can you guys hear me now? I'm using my cell phone, so I don't know how I've never used this thing before. So I don't have my uh, my my techie wife um, to help me. It's perfect. Perfect. Now. Just, perfect go for now. It. just go for it. Okay. Um, anyways, I was wondering, um, you recommend you read for insectaries in the Midwest? The Midwest, most of the most trees that I've used that I've coming from the west um, the West Coast. Okay, okay. it's happening it's again, happening. Chase. Uh, let me mute you, but I, I think he's asking for recommendations on insectaries in the Midwest because he's currently in Oklahoma. So I guess it, if it regionally, because there are people on the East Coast, you're in the Midwest. Uh, there are people kind of in the East Coast. Saul has you're on the West Coast, but go for it. Yeah, um, Oklahoma is my is part of my territory. I have probably a dozen uh, cannabis uh, customers in Oklahoma. I was just there a couple weeks ago visiting them. Um, most everyone there was uh, were indoor growers, but uh, but yeah, um, you know, I I didn't get a chance to introduce myself, but I um, I work for Beneficial Insectary. We're we're uh, we're based in the U.S. Uh, Northern California, but uh, I cover most of the southern states and uh, and Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. Oh, sorry, Raymond. You were uh, hold on. You're muted. Go okay. for it. Um, you know, we, we don't we don't have any um, biological control suppliers companies here. Uh, we rely on what's out there, and the companies that are out there will include BioBest and uh, Copert, IPM Labs out in New York, uh, Beneficial Insectary, um, Applied Bionomics up in uh, Vancouver, Canada. Um, th those are the ones, that, and then I think BioWorks now is getting into it. 
So those ones we've got, and they have, they have people like Sal tech reps that are, that handle like the Midwest or wherever they're at. Um, but that's what we deal with. We, we deal a lot with those companies. We do quality assessments, we do consulting. And so that's who, that's who we rely upon. I mean, I have dealt with most of the major companies for nearly over 20 years and feel that they have, they are very reputable. They have your interest at heart. And uh, that's why I can recommend them. Yeah. Let, let me bring up a uh, kind of not something you cover in the presentation, but kind of th this gets to kind of, so bricks is going to be the topic. And uh, it, is bricks important in plants? Like, should you be aspiring to get those levels up and why or why not? Like, like can you talk about things like aphids and kind of how they interact with the plant and those complex and simple carbohydrates? Well, we, we do know that insects um, can change the composition of plants. I mean, the reason why certain cultivars and plants are attractive is twofold, either chemical or nutritional. And we do know that uh, at certain densities or levels, uh, the pest can actually change the composition uh, of the plant, of the defensive compounds that plants produce. And so, you know, in, in, but, but there's not enough information, I don't think, to say that, uh, that the feeding by the aphids is causing a substantial decrease in CBD or THC production at this point. But it could happen. But that's, a, but that's another reason, Peter, I don't recommend spraying pesticides because we do know that certain pesticides can actually change the composition of the plant. And you obviously you don't want to go above 0.3% THC. And that's another reason. Uh, and it isn't necessarily due to the active, but the inerts in the formulation that can have some impacts on the plant. So that's another mantra I talk about why you can, if you minimize applications of uh, pesticides, formulated ones, then you minimize any potential indirect or direct effects on the plant itself. But can you kind of go into uh, like the aphids, uh, it's it's body and feeding and, and kind of what goes on when it's tapping into, you know, a, you know, the underside of a plant. Oh my gosh, there's Chase on. He brought the tech support in. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. The, the aphids are called phloem feeding insects, and the phloem is the free conducting tissues. And what they do is, they they take the proboscis, insert it, and they start withdrawing the plant sap, the phloem. It's then metabolized in their internal contents, and then any excess, because there's a there's a lot of there's that's carbohydrates and and things like that is is removed as honeydew. And the honeydew, as I mentioned, is the sticky liquid that allows the black city mold to grow because it's a good substrate. So they're taking the phloem, they're metabolizing it into carbohydrate sugars for their own use, and then any excess is excreted out of their anus or butt as honeydew. But is there evidence that like different type, like complex carbohydrates or, or are there certain types of carbohydrates that are more difficult for them to feed on? I'm not aware of that. I mean, basically, they will feed on sucrose to get glucose and fructose sugars, uh, but they 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 feed on and they feed on a wide diversity of plants. They're very prolific, so they have the ability to probably metabolize a wide diversity of carbohydrates. Obviously, um, the fact that they uh, are excreting honeydew means they're taking in more carbs than, than they need. And uh, really, I think, um, you know, they're just kind of a little processing plant for, for carbohydrates from the phloem. Um, you know, you'll see honeydew routinely in a large, infest, in a large infestation. Um, my understanding and my readings show that what um, really the grower really needs to be worried about um, with aphids is um, you can you know, increase their uh, populations or their, you know, their reproductive rate by having overnourished plants. And um, I think most of the studies I've read by overnourished, I mean, um, excess nitrogen. 
that, 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 is, cor that is correct. We have done studies ourselves here with mealy bugs. All insects respond favorably to plants getting over fertilized with nitrogen based water soluble mm -hmm. fertilizer, especially nitrogen. And the reason is because the plant becomes a better nutritional source. And, a, and insects and mites utilize amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. And a plant over fertilized has a higher amount of amino acids. And consequently, the plant, the insects or mites will develop faster. The females can reproduce more offspring or eggs. And that's, again, why we say don't over fertilize plants. Just give the plants what they need uh, for growth and development. Because if you overdo it, like you said, Sal, is you can stimulate, actually stimulate a mite or an insect outbreak. Yeah, so to your to your earlier question, Peter, you you talked about is BRICS important? Um, makes sense that it is because you're measuring photosynthates and that will translate to more, you know, plant tissue and oil production. But uh, but as far as pest management goes, um, overnourishment, specifically nitrogen, is what I would be more worried about. And, and obviously, you know, I think most people. Uh, grapple with restraining themselves from putting too much, <laughs> just wanting to put too much in there. But obviously the plant needs more nitrogen in the early stages of growth and then kind of less and less. So what what's kind of a, an amendment strategy for, like, let's say you have some raised beds uh, in your greenhouse and, you know, you're concerned, like, do I not have enough nitrogen for the early stages of growth? What, what would you advise someone to do kind of tactically to, to balance that? Like your plant needs it, but also it benefits the bugs that want to eat your plants. Well, what I recommend is both a plant tissue analysis and a soil analysis to determine what the soil will provide and what the plant has. And so, you, you know, knowing that, then that helps you to decide whether you're using a water soluble based fertilizer or a, a slow release fertilizer like Osmocote, how much to apply. And we always recommend that is uh, what, what does the soil have? What do you need to add to the soil that the plants, whether it be micronu macronutrients or micronutrients that the plant will need for development, for, for, for development in a, in a normal situation without a, an abundance of any of those micro or macronutrients. All right, Chase, let's see if the uh, the technical support has. So let me unmute you. You got to unlock. She came back over. <laughs> All right. You got any questions or comments, uh, things you've seen? Uh... Yeah, so um, we noticed that most of the operations in Oklahoma, and I think that this is pretty prevalent of most most grows that usually you always see fungus snap pressure. Um, can you guys talk a little bit more about your application times that you would recommend to actually apply these bugs and what stage of growth? And then um, obviously I also understand the importance of being um, proactive versus waiting until you actually notice these bugs before you uh, start implementing um, some type of beneficial, but can you talk a little bit more about the, the application times and then uh, the amount per plant or per square foot yeah for fungus nets as soon as you put the uh the plants are in their permanent containers you can release the row beetles or the mites or the nematodes uh and then you put up yellow sticky cards to monitor the adults so we we use the adult counts as sort of an indirect assessment of what's happening in terms of larval mortality and like we mentioned we we you know the nematodes you drench on a certain number we have found, you know, three row beetle adults for six inch container was enough for pupa, probably enough for fungus gnat larvae too. But uh, yeah, we've, we've done a lot of work with fungus gnat larvae and adults and uh, the nematodes work very well. Be sure you do a quality assessment, but it has to be done right, right after you put them in because the young plants are sensitive and at that point it wouldn't take many larvae to damage that cutting or plant as it's starting to get established. Okay. So uh, my comment on it, um, Thank you. We, often, we often describe the Steiner Nema nematode for uh, fungus gnat uh, biological control as um, the gateway drug to biocontrol. And by that we mean um, when you use it and you see the results, 
you are immediately convinced that biological control can work. Um, it is implemented in even in conventional um, operations it for you know all number of crops, mostly greenhouse crops. Um, it's it's easy and they are very effective. Um, so that that would be the go to for for biocontrol early. Um, heavy to reduce lar uh, heavier populations. This is one of those biocontrol agents that actually can cure a problem. Um, don't recommend you try to use them that way, but there's been, there are, you know, many examples of um, growers being able to bring populations of fungus gnats down to, to uh, almost zero, let's say, but you know, they'll be back. Um, that's, uh, I kind of tend to look at the rove beetles and, um, you know, the stradioleleps soil mite, the formerly known um, as hypoaspis, is kind of more bit players. They're there, uh, they're there, they're not as, let's put, let's put it as aggressive or as effective as nematodes are, or as quick as nematodes are, but they're there. Um, and, and, you know, as we know, with an integrated pest management approach, you want to integrate as many tools as you have. So definitely your nematodes, your rove beetles, and your, your uh, soil predatory mites. But you also got to think about uh, BT, um, Bacillus syringensis, um, uh, the um, Israelians uh, strain. Um, that's also another tool. Tool. So that that really is my four pronged attack on uh, on fungus gnat. Um, nematodes lead the way. Um, the the soil beetle and the soil mite. Um, but you can't ignore the uh, the soil bacteria. Um, so that's really the four for four pronged attack biological control. And don't forget you have other options. So one thing that's ignored i think is um you know uh cleanliness and sanitation uh fungus not will breed in in um in ma in uh algae okay clean up your algae under your benches clean up any um, standing pools of water you're just creating a source for more fungus gnats um repellents um we gotta we need more work on repellents for for uh uh fungus gnat i um I worked in mushrooms for a year, um, and at the time we were looking at research on cinnamaldehyde, uh, which is an, an, an oil that is, uh, it's an aldehyde that's in um, cinnamon oil. Um, it's supposed to be repellent to at least that family of, of uh, flies. Um, so that's one to consider and to think about. Um, I've heard of uh, people using ground cinnamon to to repel ants um there could be something to it there could be something to repellency um on on other botanical oils or herbal oils like uh for example thyme oil that's another one i've heard of um so these uh these can be used more more as a repellent for, to the adults okay um anything that you can do the mass trapping with the yellow um yellow tape that was discussed earlier um, you know, that, that helps. I, I think I'm not a big proponent of mass trapping, but with fungus gnat, it, it, that's clearly one that I think is, is a, a good strategy because, um, but you got to put it where those gnats are, you know, obviously hanging the tape up high above the canopy. Um, it's not going to help you as much as it will if you're somehow able to, to apply it under the canopy where they do most of their, where they're, where they hang out the most. Right. So, you know, it's it's an integrated approach where your last step would be some type of a pesticidal drench. And with all of the limitations that this crop has as far as what pesticides you can use in most of the states, you really don't have any other choice. So, you know, go with what works um, and, you know, make make biocontrols for fungus snap management a, a huge tool in, in your uh, in your toolbox. Sure. I also have another question. What what would you guys recommend in the event of almost a catastrophic loss because you you walk into a grow or an operation that has let the fungus gnats proliferate to the point where it's almost not cost effective to be able to use something like a nemesis because it's so expensive and that you know what what i've always recommended is to almost to wipe out all the beneficials and then just to reintroduce um sometimes 
but is there anything that you would recommend as a, uh, a cheaper alternative to, to doing that? I wouldn't. I mean, you just you have to start over is basically what you're talking about, Chase. I mean, there really isn't anything. And I have had the situations where the fungus hats, adults recovering the cards and the larva damages. You got to throw things away and just start over. Is now, that an enjoyable conversation to have with someone? Well, you, you have to go back and ask yourself why that happened. In a lot of cases, it was mentioned the you know, sanitation was not performed. There's allergy and there are weeds. So it really, it's not, you have to get them step backward and look at, okay, why did you have this problem? And it's related to either cultural practices, sanitation, or lack of scouting. And that's why we promote this because if you're, it, it's like going down the road with blinders on, you don't, you don't check your engine a lot often. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. And so when we see these outbreaks occurring, um, it's not a failure of the, the bio controls or pests. It's a failure of something beforehand. And it's generally related to cultural sanitation or lack of scouting program. Yeah. Amen. Again, uh, preaching, preaching to the choir, at least in my, in my case, um, monitoring, uh, can't say enough of it, um, about it. Um, one thing I will say is, uh, the majority of cannabis growers that I have, um, met don't understand, um, the role that scouting plays in other agricultural crops. Um, and the resources aren't dedicated to it. Um, I, I've asked, I've asked growers, do you scout regularly? And the, the answer will sometimes be, oh, we scout daily. I say, wow, that's great. How, how, how do you do that? Oh, well, when we're deleafing, we scout when I'm walking through the room. Um, and, uh, I, I'll be scouting, um, if I'm looking at, my irrigation, you know, my spaghettis and my steaks to make sure that nothing's plugged up. I'm scouting. So I say, you know, that's not scouting. That's multitasking. Okay. You need somebody who's putting their eyes on the plants and knows what signs and symptoms to look for and is keeping records of what I talked about already. What's out there? Where is it? How much of it is there and what life stage is it in and reporting that back. Um, you know, that, that's not, that's not what I mean by, um, you know, uh, uh, putting, putting monitoring, um, you know, resources, uh, putting somebody that out there, um, you know, multitasking, um, you really just have to devote the time and their attention to that. It sounds like uh, a lot to spend on labor, but, um, you know, um, again, you're, you know, like Raymond said, you're, you're driving with blinders otherwise. Yeah, sure, I, I, I try to I try to recommend, excuse me, that you hire somebody or have somebody devoted to nothing but 100 percent scouting because you can't take them off the line and have them help pot. You say that's your job and that's all you're going to do, and and they 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 go in there every day and or whatever and scout or monitor, detect, record information, and that's the way it has to be done. I mean, you just can't. You have to have somebody 100 percent devoted to that and trained and they understand scouting because putting a yellow sticky card up and checking it after a month is not scouting. And I think, sure, sure. I think people really have a problem with you. Well, what do you mean by scouting? I mean, I'm out there once a week. I, I, the yellow sticky cards are out there, one for 10,000 10, square feet. So they're, they're still a disjoint, I believe, which is pretty sad because we've, we've got a lot of information out there. Uh, and it's a case by case basis. You know, somebody doing tomato crops, their scouting will be different from somebody doing a cannabis crop. So, you know, but, but it goes back to the fact that if you're serious about it, you need a commitment to having one individual just doing that as their full time job. Sure. So 100 percent agreed. 100 percent agreed. Sorry. Sorry, Chase. Um, I just got to I have to throw in here. Um, I've I've been at this for probably eight years now, um, you know, I, organic uh, sustainable crop protection. Um, but four of those years have been in cannabis. So I have helped growers put together, you know, a, a monitoring programs that cover every, uh, every one of the major pests. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there are methods to do this. I, um, one of the things I do offer to, to my customers is, um, you know, a, a PowerPoint presentation that I give on how to, how to, um, you know, signs and symptoms, and also how to devise a scouting uh, program. There's not, there are not a lot of resources out there 
um, at, I've looked that, that help you actually devise a really good program. Um, so you kind of have to rely on someone who's done it before. I've done it, you know, for about four years now. So I have some basic guidelines. So if anyone needs help out there, just reach out to me. I'm sure um, I'm sure Peter's going to put my contact out there on this podcast. So anyways, the, the question that I wanted to ask both of you is usually by the time that somebody calls me and I go into an operation, it's usually almost at that point where they have, you know, expended all the resources. And most of the time I would say, hey, you just need to reset the room like Raymond was saying. But, you know, sometimes that's not an option. And I know that I did a presentation where I walked into a grow that was literally, you know, I, I would say being super conservative two weeks but in my opinion a week away from a catastrophic loss um and the, the wife and i were able to reset the whole entire room and what we did uh, as a cheap alternative is because we were very limited on the resources so we literally got a um, 55 gallon drum of 34 percent hydrogen peroxide um and we diluted it down to three percent and we just wiped the whole entire soil um, and, and at the time, that was what our skill set was, um, because, again, there was no option. They didn't want to uh, buy um, like the mosquito dunks or spend the money on nematodes to be able to do a super big flush with that. Um, they didn't want to transplant because the plants had been overgrown. So, I mean, almost every scenario that you can imagine that you wouldn't want to deal with in a commercial operation. But, you know, sometimes that especially in a new state, you see people um, that because they can enter the industry, they enter in almost blindly and they don't think about a lot of these things like integrated pest management. Um, I tell everyone that that's the first person that you hire, regardless if you're a commercial grower, a processor, or even a retail location, just because you need that player at all levels. Um, so that's extremely important. And then also the scouts, you know, that's the same people that you hire, just like your uh, your veg team or your flower team. But at the same time, you know, not all these infrastructures have the automation to be able to do these things. So a lot of people are like, hey, I can openly or blindly scale and they do all these things and they really bite off more than they can chew. Um, so obviously at that point, it turns into how do you do this for the, the cheapest amount of labor, the cheapest amount of product all in. And what I like to say to them is, you know, hey, you know, if you would have done it this way, and this is the reason why it's important to reach out to people like Raymond and Saul and then, you know, people like myself ahead of time so you can integrate all these things. But that's not the, the reality of it. Um, and then, you know, depending on if you are... Um, just in a life scenario where you plant plants outside and you check on them a couple weeks um, is stuff like hydrogen peroxide, a, a viable solution whenever it, it's super cheap. And then, um, you know, what do you recommend for, for people that are limited and they don't know they need something that kind of encompasses as much as possible for the least amount of money because biologicals at scale, if you're trying to fight something versus preventative, it's almost not cost effective a lot of times is what most people's thought process is. It's it's definitely not cost effective to try to use biocontrol to cure a problem. I, I'd agree with that. You have to know how to use it right. I think there's a bit of a learning curve um, to, to, being used, to using them effectively. Um, that's what my job is basically um, to, to, to speed up the learning curve for the grower. Um, basically my experience, you know, where I have fallen flat on my face, make sure that the grower can avoid that. Um, on the question of the hydrogen peroxide, that might be a state by state question. Um, there are products out there that you can use, um, it, that you can drench the, the soil with. Um, but typically they're very, very low concentrations of hydrogen peroxide because of the potential for root burn. Right. Um, so if it's not hurting the root hairs, then what's the likelihood it's going to hurt a fungus gnat maggot? Um, that's, you know, that's questionable. Um, if you're using it at rates that aren't on the label or using a product that's not pesticidal, well, then you have another whole other issue of compliance going on there. So, yeah, I think, Chase, that's a case by case basis. I'd have to look at the situation. Um, 
But these hydrogen peroxide products, xerotol and things like that, they're biocides to kill everything. But it's really, to me, it'd be a case-by-case -case basis and a state-by-state -state basis too, what they can use. Uh, but again, my question would go back is, what, wh why, did it, why did it get to that level? How did it get to that point? What, what collapsed in this production process that led to, um, you know, spider mites out of control, whatever, the things that you described? I, I'd have to go back and, you know, play detective says, let's go back to the, the problem to solve the problem, but where did it start? Sure. One of the advantages of this crop too is it's it's fast and you do have the opportunity to reset. You're not keeping a perennial crop out there where you're keeping the pest out there, you know, in the field, um, you know, from from one cycle to the next. So you do have the, you know, what you do have the option to, you know, what we used to call um, turnaround, right? After you've harvested a crop, then it's about, okay, didn't do so well on pests on that one, had really huge issues with fungus gnat. I'm gonna do everything possible to get this room sanitary or this greenhouse sanitized to the point where I'm not gonna see this again. And I have an opportunity to use soft approaches, including you know preventative biological control and for it to work the next round. Sure. So, you know, for me, this goes to an infrastructure deal as well, because obviously, you know, a lot of times the cleanliness issue really goes back to fundamentals um, and being able to keep your area clean. Obviously, that's the, the number one thing to be able to eliminate a lot of these things. And obviously, by cleaning, you're doing the inspecting. So that's when you are able to address these things. Then obviously, you know, people think that the yellow sticky cards are a way to eliminate a pest versus it just being an indicator to say, hey, this pest is in this area. Uh, but at the same time, that that's the reality of what I find. Um, what do you think about inline products? And then um, as far as like a internal fogging machine, something that like say that you had a problem where biologicals weren't enough and you would you know stereotypically kill a room um when would you recommend or would you recommend to have an inline fogging system built into a room just to be able to on the reset sanitize the entire room um, because if you're using a sprayer if someone's out with a wand and they're spraying a room i think there's always going to be that human error aspect so i think that something is always going to be missed um, and that's the, the reason why I like the idea of a fogging technology uh, to be able to essentially hit every you know square inch of that, your rafters above your lights, the areas that a lot of people um, don't take in consideration when they're resetting their rooms that stuff like powdery mildew and bugs and stuff can harbor. Well, the, the bottom line again is coverage. I mean, if you think the fogging is gonna do it, and you're using the proper concentration material that's going to result in lethality, that's fine. But but if not, I, I, I really like high volume because you have control over it. You can use a, a lot of solution. Uh, and that's just my feedback on that, Chase. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my comment on it is I like foggers. Don't get me wrong. I like um, the coverage, the the whole idea of getting these these tiny droplet sizes deep into the canopy and essentially, you know, creating this mist. Problem with that is, um, well, it's not the first, the, the, the positive. I like it for sanitation, using something like a hydrogen peroxide um, to sanitize. Um, you know, the, a room, for example, it's a great idea because you're going to get that coverage. But um, when it comes to an insecticide, most of the products that are allowed for cannabis in this country um, aren't, uh, are, aren't real pesticides. They're, you know, soft stuff like oils and soaps. And you need very good coverage there, especially with oils. Oils are intended to suffocate the insect, to plug up its breathing uh, apparatus. If you put a, you know, very tiny droplet out there, your chances of, of um, you know, uh, of suffocating an insect is going to be, you know, very little. And uh, I think uh, the closer they are to the fogger, yeah, maybe you might you might suffocate them. So I'm I'm of the mind, uh, just like Raymond, when you're doing uh, turnaround, when you're sanitizing, it's about really getting everything in, in, you know, getting all those nooks and crannies and using materials that are going to be, you know, using a, a, a equipment that's going to allow you to really get really good coverage and you know, really good soaking of those, maybe those, those insects that maybe still hanging around. 
Yeah, well, one of the things I recommend is we've been using a lot of what we call water sensitive paper and it's a yellow paper. Uh, you put it on among your crop, it turns blue. And I can tell you people, have, their eyes have been opened widely when they think they're getting good coverage and you put this material out there and it comes back and it's still mostly yellow. So uh, water sensitive paper to me is, is sort of mandatory in our operations uh, when we're doing spray applications because it really gives you a, a, uh, a quantitative snapshot of how well you're doing with whatever, based on whether equipment and whatever volume you're using. Absolutely. Um, I don't think you'll get yellow, uh, those that, that yellow indicator uh, paper that you're talking about to show up to, to indicate that it's actually been, um, you know, that it's seen any moisture if you're using a room fogger. If so, so that's, that's a good way to look at it is take, take the indicator paper that, that Raymond's uh, talking about and T-Jet, um, they, they make nozzles, they, they have a good one, they have a good uh, product. Um, put the papers far away from the fogger and prove to yourself how very little color change has occurred. Um, if the, if it hasn't changed color um, using a fogger, then it's not going to hurt an insect, right? Um, so yeah, those are great. The other thing that's great about those indicator uh, papers is, um, you know, you never know. I mean, unless you're there at you know four in the morning or seven p.m. in the evening when your sprayers are actually doing the job. Um, how good of a job are they doing? Are they wanting? Are they tired that day? Or they want to get out of there? Or you know, um, want to go home and, and then have beer or whatever? Um, just just the knowledge of you know that of them, you know, knowing that you're putting out those papers at any time, you know, that they may not know where they are. It kind of encourages them to do a good job every time. You can always come back around and say, "Hey, I found this." indicator paper I put out there and it's completely dry. You know, we need to improve, you need to improve your, your spray pattern, your technique, you know, so good training of the sprayers, good equipment, giving them all the tools to succeed. But at the same time, it's a good way to, to kind of ensure that, you know, the, the, the sprayer is going to do a good job. So, um, so I agree using those as, you know, really, really smart tool. Sure. You know, that's where automation, you know, kind of intersects with craft, you know, that once you get to a certain size, you have to do certain things or certain things start happening as a result of that. And for me, that's when you start seeing the disconnect between production or scaled cannabis versus craft is because some of these things are missed. Um, would you guys um, give us a, uh, a generic maybe starter um way to be able to use beneficials and how to be able to hit everything that would stereotypically be in a grow. And we'll just be really vague and say that obviously we would have to address your soil borne um, pathogens, um, a, a spider mite, and then say aphids, um, and then fungus gnats. We'll say those three things. Like what would you set up to be able to do that? And cost is obviously another thing. So people are always going to be looking at how do you set that up for you know the least amount of money or the most effective bang for the buck well first of all i don't like to make things any more complex than they are and if you're talking about a scenario with aphids and mites and something uh, you know you really have to focus in what's the, what's the major insect and let's just say what's the, it's aphids then i would go ahead and target those but then you still have to deal with the mite so really i think chasing that you know, i mean Biological control will work, but it doesn't work in every situation. It's a case-by-case -case basis. When you're dealing with, because today we are dealing with multiple pest complexes. We have growers that have thrips, white flies, and aphids. And I don't recommend, you know, more than two biological control agents because it gets too complex. You've got mutual interference. You've got integral predation coming in. And you, you, you're just going to have to have to make a choice. And, and, and I, I don't really feel comfortable giving a really generic example because, a lot of things can happen in the implementation of it. So um, I also have to go pretty soon, but I think, Chase, it's more of a case-by-case -case basis, talking to the grower, getting some background, you know, figuring out why spider mites are the problem, why aphids are the problem, and maybe hone in on one and maybe use something different, not in, you know, either a cultural or sanitation aspect to deal with the other one. Yeah, I um my approach is um Thank I've been you. working I've been working with these growers uh, with cannabis growers here for for a bit now and um, 
basically when a grower asks that sort of a question is, well, what do you recommend for like a comprehensive IPM program? Then I say, okay, well, I've got a questionnaire that I'd like you to fill out um, and it'll basically give me an idea of your crop cycle, okay? And then also I'd like to know what materials you have confidence in that you've you know, worked with before and you, you know, that way I can look through to see on your list what is compatible with biocontrol and also what is less than compatible and then how you should go about making a decision on whether you use that material um, with biocontrol. Generally, I do recommend for the major pests um, in indoor and greenhouse, it's different than outdoor, um, but just because a lot of this is going on in greenhouse and indoor, basically I'm, I'm looking out for primary, you know, number one pest would be the spider mites because that everyone has spider mites. So there's got to be an, an approach to spider mite. Um, then, you know, with the risk of aphid, it's good to have some generalists out there too. Um, some generalists that will target aphids, not necessarily the parasitoid wasps right away, but something that'll that can um, that will also feed on other things beyond just the aphid. So there's there's uh, there are uh, biocontrol agents that you know that fall into that description. Um, a lot of cannabis growers are concerned with uh, fungus gnat. Um, there's we've already talked about strategies. Um, thrips is is the other one. Um, those are primarily the ones we worry about as far as biological control goes. I, I really, really um, appreciate, Raymond, that you mentioned uh, hemp russet mite and how, you know, we just don't have the literature yet to be able to recommend any commercially available uh, predator, at least not the ones that are commonly available commercially, to control it. So I do not uh, have a uh, hemp russet mite biocontrol recommendation. Um, sure, there could be strategies that involve um, some of the uh, predatory mites out there, but I'm not going to sit here and recommend that you buy this expensive uh, predatory mite so that for it to control your hemp russet mite um, outbreak. There are other strategies for that, and it it's case by case. Um, that's why working with you know your IPM specialists, you know the growers that work closely with me, we're you know able to come up with programs that work for them. And then um, after a while, it's all really based on monitoring and where you want to put your resources. If you've got the thrips under control, then, you know, maybe you don't want to spend half of your budget on thrips anymore, right? Maybe you want to, you know, release less frequency or with or at lower rates. Um, that Those kind of decisions, but those are all based on monitoring, right? So yeah, case by case, but again, you know, that's why people like myself are around for for guidance um you know help you help you you know design a program that works for your grow you know your particular crop cycle and preferred materials um and um, and then you know just help guide you so that eventually you get to the point where it's like okay this is working and this is where you know now i can really you know um really start moving more towards bios and farther away from sprays. Yeah, but before I go, Peter, I have to say that, you know, Saul, I agree. Compatible doesn't mean anything from a scientific standpoint. We talk about integration and we do a lot of that work. And when, you, when you're talking about integrating biological controls with pesticides, you get into a whole complex. We, we've been spending 10 years on that. And the thing is the materials that are registered are out there like oils and soaps and silver they're all harmful to natural enemies directly. So it's like you can't use those with a mite or a parasitoid because you're going you're gonna to disrupt your biocontrol program. So, you know, that's, that's an issue. And again, it's also it's a case-by-case -case basis. Look, And so at that, I'm just going to kind of leave it because I'm going to have to go. It's getting close to the 90 minutes. But it has been a joy uh, doing this, meeting Saul and Chase. And if you ever have any questions or comments, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. And we'll uh, do the best we can to help cannabis growers to overcome some of these, uh, in this case, orthopod pest problems. Well, we appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we didn't scare you away and you'll come back again soon. I, I had a bunch of additional questions. There was one, I don't know if you have one minute, but uh, Matthew, who's in the audience right now, wanted me to ask you about the kinky sex lives of parasitic wasps. <laughs> I don't know if they have kinky sex lives. Basically, the they come out, they, uh, they, they mate, and then the fam females lay eggs. It's, it's not like cockroaches or bed bugs where it's very uh, hard in the female, but it's not really kinky sex. Uh, you know, I like think uh, uh, madness is where the, the, the female may eat the male, uh, so it better be good the first time. So 
mean, I don't think it's it's very parasitoids are kind of boring for sex life, then Peter. Okay. Matthew might be referring to um, aphidolides, aphidomyza. That, now that's a oh, kinky. Yeah, that's, yeah, a that's a kinky. That's different. different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kelly Vance uh, has a really good presentation on that. They basically what's kinky about them is, um, I guess, they're kind of what like kind of like masochists. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna have to go, Peter. So I I can talk more yeah, about that right. if you're yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we'll 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 let Raymond go and we'll let uh Saul uh talk about bugs with the kinkiest sex life. Yeah, Affidulia is a fit of mine. So it does have a very interesting sex life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Raymond. Good to meet you, Raymond. You too. Bye. Stay in touch. I will. All right. So Saul, let's hear it. <laughs> um. Okay. So it's, I have not used a fidelities, but you know, Kelly, I know Kelly well, we work together. Um, he's using, uh, he, he create, he, he, his recommendation is if you're trying to establish this, first of all, it's a midge, it's a little teeny tiny fly that lays its eggs in um, aphid or lays eggs in uh, near aphid colonies. And then when the, um, the larva hatches, um, it's a little maggot um, that will actually sit there and, or the, actually move into the colony and chomp away at aphids. So it's not a parasitoid. It's not putting an egg inside of the of the aphid. It's literally just eating them um, alive. Um, anyway, they um, these little these little midges, these little tiny flies, um, they have a habit where um, my understanding is the females um, or maybe it was the males will look for a spider web um, and attach themselves to it. And that's yeah, I think it's the females, and then the males are attracted to the to to the um, the struggling uh, to the struggling uh, female, um, and and so I guess just, what's just cute, quickly is, is this the right yes, bug? Yes, okay. that's it. Um, and and I guess what's kinking about that is um, basically in order to mate, you're putting yourself uh, at the risk of being eaten alive by a by a spider. Um, so that's a little bit like what that. Uh, asphyxiation, you know, fetish that's out there where you risk your life for, you know, sexual pleasure, I guess. That's okay. it. Well, so what's interesting here is that, you know, that, that's actually a good bug to have, right? Yes, yes. Okay. It's commercially available. Um, it works in, in uh, all kinds of crops. Um, not sure about how effective it is in cannabis. I tend to want to recommend some uh, a parasitoid. Uh, I've seen the results from using parasitoids. Um, they're great. Um, these are a little bit. I, I like to say. I don't have the experience enough to say that that they'll that they'll work in cannabis. Um, the canopy, the cannabis canopy, the typical canopy. Um, I'm not sure it lends itself to the use of this biocontrol agent, but not enough growers have tried it. So, you know, I certainly am not going to say it won't work, but uh, um, it works great in, in lots of other crops. Um, but th they have a different canopy architecture than than does cannabis. Yeah, I was trying to find a nice big picture of it, but. Uh, yeah, the um, stripper eyelashes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the um, the antenna have those hairs on them, and they they curl back like that. They're really tiny and uh, you know very delicate, um, but uh, they they will do a number on aphids. Got it. Saul, is there a uh, a next super bug for cannabis that you're forecasting to be the the next big pest that we're going to have to deal with? Um. I mean, I get to see a lot of grows in different states. Um, honestly, right now, the hop latent viroid is, to me, the biggest concern. If we ever find that it is vectored by an insect, which I want to, you know, reiterate, we don't know that yet. Um, if it's vectored by an insect, then that's going to be a game changer. Um, see, what, I'm, what I've been hearing a lot more about in fact, I'm going to go visit a grower today who is battling leaf hoppers. Um, leaf hoppers can be problematic. Their feeding damage can be problematic in some crops. The main issue with the leaf hopper in cannabis is that we have found there's a virus that certain leaf hoppers can transmit. It is it 
shows symptoms and actually can can hurt your crop, uh, your cannabis crop, uh, the beet curly top virus. I think, uh, Peter, we talked about it in at another podcast, um, but um, that's a concern because it's a tough uh, insect to deal with. Um, and uh, it could be a devastating virus if it, you know, gets in your crop. So, um, yeah, um, as far as next super predators, there's there are some predatory mites out there that are really interesting that we're looking at. Um, but, you know, that's about all I, all I can say right now. <laughs> so, someone actually asked uh, in the beginning of the show, uh, not leaf hoppers, but tree hoppers. Mm -hmm. There, I've I have seen uh, tree hoppers, frog hoppers, all that. Um, that basically that um, those families of insects in cannabis. Uh, the one of concern, the one of most concern for me has been leaf hopper because it's the only one I have experienced um, with um, really causing problems in a number of crops. Add to that the possibility of vectoring this beet curly top virus, um, or even um, uh, there's there's a few other uh, there's other micro microorganisms that they can also vector, meaning move from plant to plant. Um, you know that that risk right there makes them puts them on my radar. Um, leaf hoppers and frog hoppers and all the, all the other ones that are kind of related. I'm not I'm not I'm not as concerned. All right, so we have here we have all right the tree hopper on the way right, the leaf hopper on the way left. You can see these are all in different families. So, for example, the leaf hopper cicadelity, um, but aphids are aphididae. Um, so they're so they're all in basically the um, they are all true bugs. What are you know called true bugs? Um, back in the day, these were called homopterans because their wings uh, didn't look different from each other. I guess what it was versus the the other bugs that we're used to, like. Uh, like Ligus bug or something like that. But um, yeah, these are all usually, um, you know, sap suckers um, with with piercing uh, mouth parts. Um, and many of them produce honeydew. Um, so like the white fly and aphids do and um, uh, psyllids, a number of them do. Uh, but they're all just kind of fast multiplying, you know, you know, take over. And a lot of them actually move uh, viruses. It's a bummer because some of, I mean, they're pretty cool looking, but then you're like, you got to go. Yeah. 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 I, I, I love them. I, I love arthropods. I, you know, grew up as a kid catching everything I could, but uh, <laughs> my job now is to, to get rid of them. Right. At least the bad ones. I guess I have one more question. I'm going to have to jump off of here. I actually have to go to uh, to work. Um, but um, wanted to know about what you would recommend as far as when you're scouting. Um, say, for example, that you find a living soil type situation that someone has um, a bunch of ants. So obviously with ants, you would look, you know, for uh, aphids just because of them being able to harvest that honeydew. Um, what are some of the, the things that you start looking for whenever you are inspecting some of those living soil or those natural um, habitats spaces for bugs whenever you don't have access to every single plant being able to pull, you know, something that's really big and robust and you just can't, you know, go through all those within a reasonable time frame? Um, yeah, as far as ants, um, I wouldn't go the biocontrol route. There's probably no predator that that's commercially available out there that's going to have a, an easy time with, you know, with the way they work, which is basically attack you a, as a group. Um, and they have their, their mandibles and their poisons and they don't give up. Um, so you, you kind of have to deal with ants in any other way that you possibly can. We talked a little bit about repellents. I've heard that cinnamon oils, that they don't like cinnamon oils. You know, you, you might be able to find um, some kind of a spray that you can use to repel them. Um, um, they, uh, they also, um, you know, most, most home, you know, people in, in, in homes that, 
you know have ant problems they will um they use bait bait stations bait traps right so it's uh, basically it's a little a little bait a little station inside of it there's a sugary or attractive substance with some kind of a stomach poison um the ant you know finds the sugar takes it back to its nest and then kills the entire colony um there is an or an organic version of that it's uh, it's basically boric acid um ants if you if you mix boric acid with a sweet solution there's there's a product out there already just can't remember the name of it um but if you i can get it to you later peter um, but you, you know, it's mixed with boric acid mixed with a sugary substance that takes a lot of feeding, but it will kill them. And it is, it is not toxic. Like, you know, some other poison would be it takes a little bit longer, but it, but they can be effective. So, you know, um, and yeah, trying to keep them out of the grow Li living soil is tough with ants. Um, and ants not only, you know, um, encourage aphids, you know, and, and, and you know, uh, basically protect. They protect them. So any and all of your biocontrol ag uh, agents. So lacewing larvae, um, aphidias wasps, the the aphidolides, whatever you might be using out there that the 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 ant can see and, and attack. They're gonna they're gonna protect the the aphid colony because you know there's it's essentially like their cattle. They're milking them for the honeydew. Right, so it's just like a farmer sees a wolf hanging out, or a coyote hanging out near his uh, corral. Um, you know, he's gonna go get a shotgun. So I just know that you know these are some of the the problems that you see, you know, in in the field, and they're things that you know people want to deal with. And I get asked all the time, you know, how do we make a a perimeter defense that is for one cost effective, and two not going to be um, you know, super destructive to like the watershed or, you know, potentially mm -hmm. the, the ecosystem of, of the area. So, um, you know, it's just uh, so, something that I have a lot of interest in. But at the same time, I know that it is a challenge for both commercial and home growers. Yeah. Answer. Answer a bane. Um, another one. Another thing I just thought about is um, some growers actually taken sticky, sticky substances. Um, you know, like what's on the um, on the sticky traps, the yellow cards, you know, um, some type of a glue and paint and painted their trunks with it. Um, and that makes it so the ants can't have an easy way up and down. You know, their colonies are usually going to be subterranean. So down in the in the soil bed is where their colony will be. Well, if they have a huge, you know, sticky, you know, Part of the if part of the um, trunk is sticky, they can't easily get up there, right? If you have a trellis, they'll climb right up a post and up through the trellis and into the canopy. So you might have to paint, you know, the post as well. But it's a good strategy because you know you don't you're not allowing them access. Basically, it's an exclusion strategy, right? So if you do get aphid, they have a harder time tending to them, and your biocontrols have the advantage. Well, why don't we end on that? Because I think everybody has stuff to do. Just quickly, Saul, are you on? Uh, I realize, are you on Instagram? Um, our company is Beneficial Insectary. I'm right. not. I'm, I'm kind of an antisocial hermit. I like that. Here, let me just throw that up. Cause but yeah, Beneficial right. Insectary. Whoop, hold on. Give me one second. And you have my email, so you can go ahead and publish that. Um, you know, anyone feel free to reach out. Um, we're here to help. There's the company. There's the man. And uh, <laughs> you're cool with me putting your email address? Of course. Yeah. Right. Please. Right. Thank you. All right. Well, actually, sorry. <laughs> Why? I, I have your uh, your personal one. What's your work one? Uh, that would be S A U L dot A L B A at insectary just like it's spelled there with an a dot com sol.alba at insectary.com all right i just put it in the chat and i will put it uh everybody bear with me the website's insectary.com so you can find contact information for us there too you guys got a good domain name mm, yeah 
Yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, and Chase, you're on Instagram. Terp Isle. Let me just find you. Terp. Well, a lot of Terp. Uh, Terp Isle Genetics is the only one that I have up. Uh, I just, I don't like social media. So right now I'm primarily just using my uh, my personal one, which is the Chase 0420. Um, All right, zero four. Yep, there you are. All right. Hold on. And there is Chase. Wait, do you have. Oh, you do have posts. Okay. Got it. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Chase and Sewell, for being sports and jumping on with uh, zero notice. <laughs> I was like, Raymond Cloyd speaking. Anyone want to jump on? So uh, I appreciate I'm usually it. I'm usually stationary on Fridays now nowadays. So you can you you can probably count on being able to find me at the last minute on a Friday. Cool. And uh, all right, so just quickly, yeah, Friday morning. So Saturday, I don't know if he's lurking in the chat, but we got uh, Chad Westport. Sunday, possibly James Loud. And uh, I know Pedro down here in uh, SoCal is chopping this week and wanted to do a live, uh, a live chop uh, of his garden. Uh, he's uh, live bubble hash on Instagram. So hopefully we'll set that up and maybe a a wash and a squish but uh anyway thank you everyone thanks, thanks enjoy, peter enjoy good meeting you chase yeah you as well i'll be in touch all right, all right. have a good one thanks peter all right. all right see you guys see you guys and we will keep